honestly, a bunch of people probably will die in the beginning. It's yeah. it's tough sledding over there. You We're know? an exploring um, species. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not forever. We don't want to make anyone go, so it's, like, <laughs> it's volunteers only. There's uh, a reason Mars is known as a graveyard for spacecraft. Missions to the Red Planet haven't exactly had a smooth track record. The first five attempts by the Soviet Union, four didn't even make it out of Earth's orbit, and the fifth lost contact along the way. The U.S. didn't have much better luck at first either. Mariner 3 reached space but ran into mechanical problems and couldn't finish its mission. Thankfully, we've come a long way since then. We're getting better at landing unmanned probes on Mars, and success rates have definitely improved. But let's be honest, no matter how many robots we send up there, it will never compare to the moment we put actual people on the surface. So the question is, can we pull it off with Starship? To answer that question, the first thing we need to figure out is how long the trip to Mars will actually take. The shortest possible distance between Earth and Mars is about 57 million kilometers. At this proximity, a NASA spacecraft traveling at 58,000 kilometers per hour could theoretically reach Mars in just over 40 days, which is remarkably fast, at least in theory. However, that kind of straightforward journey only exists on paper. In reality, space travel is far more complex. A direct, uninterrupted path isn't feasible due to the influence of planetary gravity, limited fuel capacity, and the need to carry life-sustaining resources, especially for manned missions. So, how much time it really takes to get to Mars depends heavily on timing and the constantly shifting dynamics of the solar system. Both Earth and Mars travel in elliptical orbits, and the distance between them varies significantly. To make missions as efficient as possible, space agencies like NASA wait for a special moment called a launch window. This alignment happens roughly every 26 months, when the positions of Earth and Mars are just right. Any mission, including one using Starship, will need to take advantage of this window to save time and fuel. During this window, Starship can take advantage of a fuel-efficient route called the Hohmann Transfer Orbit. This method involves launching the spacecraft into an elliptical orbit around the Sun that intersects with Mars's orbit. The spacecraft accelerates to escape Earth's gravity, then coasts along this transfer path before using another engine burn to slow down and enter orbit around Mars. Eventually, it can descend to the Martian surface. Although this trajectory is the most energy efficient, it is not particularly fast. Even with current chemical propulsion systems, such as those planned for SpaceX's Starship, assuming no other advanced propulsion is used, the trip typically takes about 260 days, or 8 to 9 months. One important point to note is that engineers must calculate the optimal trajectory for sending a spacecraft from Earth to Mars well before the mission begins. These calculations take into account not just the distance between the planets, but also fuel efficiency and timing. It's a bit like throwing a dart at a moving target. They have to predict where Mars will be when the spacecraft arrives, not where it is at the time of launch. Additionally, the spacecraft must decelerate upon arrival to successfully enter orbit around Mars. Otherwise, it could overshoot the planet entirely. In short, Mars has to be in exactly the right place by the time the spacecraft reaches its orbital path. Along the way, we also have to tackle major challenges related to human health and the resources required for extended deep space missions. These include problems like the gradual loss of bone density and the constant threat of exposure to cosmic radiation. These are not minor inconveniences, but still, they are part of the price we must be willing to pay for such a journey. After months of traveling through space, our starship has finally reached Mars. But we won't be landing on the planet just yet. You see, landing on Mars is no easy task. The Mariner missions showed us that Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which means there's not much air resistance to help slow down a spacecraft. At the same time, Mars has enough gravity to pull objects down fast. That combination of thin atmosphere, strong gravity, and high entry speed makes it extremely hard to slow a lander down enough to avoid crashing. For smaller missions, NASA has often used parachutes. Even though the Martian atmosphere is much thinner than Earth's, it still provides some resistance. Some rovers, 
like curiosity and perseverance, used engine thrust to slow down during the final stage of descent in a technique called the sky crane method. Others, like Spirit and Opportunity, used giant airbags to cushion their landings, but Starship is far too large and heavy to do any of that. Instead, it will have to rely almost entirely on its own propulsion system to make a controlled, powered landing on the Martian surface. Like I said before, when Starship arrives at its destination, it must reduce its velocity to achieve orbit or to land. The challenge is that Starship uses a lot of its fuel just to get to Mars. To ensure there's enough fuel left for a safe landing later, it needs to perform a maneuver called aero braking before its final descent. Starship will perform a relatively small engine burn to enter an elongated elliptical orbit. Each time it passes through the atmosphere at the orbit's low point, it experiences atmospheric drag, gradually slowing the vehicle down with each pass. But there's only so much slowing down Starship can do with those atmospheric passes before it eventually has to dive in for a full-on entry into the Martian atmosphere. When that happens, it'll come in belly first to create as much drag as possible and slow itself down. Heat shields will take the brunt of the intense heat during this part of the descent. As it gets closer to the surface, Starship will flip upright and fire its Raptor engines for a final landing burn, using up whatever fuel's left to bring its speed down to almost zero. Then, landing legs will pop out to help it land safely. The whole process is totally autonomous since the communication time delay between Earth and Mars is way too long to control from the home planet. Even if you manage to land safely on Mars, that's really just the beginning. The real challenge starts after the touchdown. SpaceX's whole mission plan depends heavily on in-situ resource utilization, especially for making fuel to come back home. To produce the two key propellants, liquid methane and liquid oxygen, you need a production plant along with access to water and carbon dioxide. Water will have to be extracted from ice deposits near the landing site, either just below the surface or from exposed areas. So picking a landing site with confirmed ice deposits is critical. Without it, you can't make fuel, and without fuel, you're not going home. Storage is another issue. Tanks for LOX and liquid CH4 will be needed. And in the first few missions, they'll likely just reuse the tanks of the landed starships. On top of that, you need a reliable power source to run everything. The propellant plant, habitats, rovers, and all other systems. SpaceX is looking at nuclear reactors as the main power source because solar panels have serious limitations on Mars. The sunlight is weaker, the panels only work during the day, and they can get coated in dust especially during long-lasting dust storms. Nuclear power, on the other hand, works day and night in any weather. For moving around, a fleet of modular rovers will be needed. Some will transport astronauts and cargo, while others will handle hauling heavy infrastructure off the starships and help with base construction. But here's the big issue, mass. Current technology for making propellant on Mars is still too heavy and power-hungry for what's needed to fuel even two starships. On top of that, the tech isn't mature yet. We're talking about high development costs, complex engineering challenges, and probably a decade before it's flight ready. Unfortunately, there aren't many good alternatives. Swapping out nuclear power for solar would introduce even more risks, especially during dust storms. And there's no skipping the fuel production step since it's essential. Because of all this, SpaceX's more ambitious timelines, like launching full-scale Mars missions by 2027 or even 2029, might be too optimistic with the tech we have right now. So if going to Mars is so hard, why bother at all? Well, Elon Musk sees Mars as humanity's backup plan. As the sun ages, it's getting brighter and hotter. In a few hundred million years, that extra heat could strip away Earth's atmosphere and boil the oceans dry, which would probably spell the end of life as we know it. And in about five billion years, things get even worse when the sun expands into a red giant and completely engulfs Earth. As Musk put it, that's one of the benefits of Mars. It is life insurance for life collectively. Of course, if we don't accidentally nuke ourselves, 
the end of the world is still a long way off. But if we start figuring out how to become an interplanetary species now, we could develop enough technology to deal with it when the time comes. Even though landing humans on Mars is a huge challenge, once we figure it out, it will get a lot easier. Back in 2016, Musk considered using a Mars cycler as a long-term plan. SpaceX could use Starship to build a dedicated space transport platform that would orbit between Earth and Mars every 26 months. The platform would likely be built in Earth's orbit to whatever size is needed and could transport all the passengers required during each synod. When the planets align, powerful chemical engines would send the platform on a trajectory toward Mars. And once it's in motion, it would maintain that velocity indefinitely thanks to conservation of momentum. After that, only a small amount of propellant would be needed to make minor adjustments, ensure it's on the right slingshot trajectory, and keep it stable. Conventional starships could shuttle people and propellant to and from the cycler as it flies by each planet. Outgoing starships would match the trajectory of the cycler and dock with it for the interplanetary journey. Once they arrived, they would detach and land on Mars, while more starships would head up to dock with the platform. This system would significantly reduce the number of crew starships needed, along with all the extra tankers and fuel depots required to support their missions. Plus, the Mars Cycler could be designed with a closed-loop ecosystem to produce its own food, air, and water, giving passengers much more comfort compared to a regular crew starship. Over the long journey, the Cycler could even have spin gravity for comfort and be equipped with radiation shielding. However, the Cycler would only cut down on the number of starships needed to transport people. They'd probably still need to launch the same amount of cargo starships. This means a Cycler might only become a practical option once Mars is fully self-sufficient. Once Mars can produce all the essential goods locally, the only starship missions needed would be for passenger transport to and from Earth, with a little space for some luxury cargo. And that's where the Mars Cycler would really shine since it's perfectly suited for this kind of job. Unfortunately, this approach comes with a built-in challenge. Crew starships must precisely match the velocity of the cycler and rendezvous with it as it swings past each planet. A starship configured to carry 1,000 passengers is only viable for such missions if it can reach the cycler within a few hours. If the trip takes longer, say days, the vehicle simply would not have the life support capacity to sustain that many people. Thankfully, scenarios where this becomes a critical issue are expected to be rare. Most minor issues, like a single engine failure, could be addressed by extending the burn duration using the remaining engines. It is only in the event of a major malfunction, such as a catastrophic drop in propellant pressure or loss of flight control, that a safe rendezvous would be truly at risk. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content like this.